Hello and welcome to M&A Murders and Accusations, the good, the bad, and the ugly of selling your business. We dig into what you need to know and how not to kill the sell of your business. Now here's our host, Rick J. Krebs, Mergers and Acquisitions Advisor. Hello and welcome to the podcast today. This is Rick Krebs coming to you from the mountains of Utah, your M&A cowboy, murders and accusations. Today we're not talking about murders or accusations, we're talking about lending. And I've got the lending expert here on my on my podcast, uh, Jeremy Willis. Jeremy and I have been working together, I don't know, for several years now, maybe even eight or ten years and we just realized we've never met in person. We've worked together on <laughs> transactions and uh, never met in person, but uh, I feel like I'm meeting him here for the first time today. But um, I used to send, Jeremy was pestering me with emails for a while. I had a couple of other lenders and and he would pester me. And uh, and finally, I just threw him a bone, gave him one, and it was a hard one. And he ended up getting it done. And uh, I threw him another one, got that one done. And I'm like, you know what? I think I need to start sending him the good deals, the ones that uh, are are hard that are the turn down. So uh, that being said, uh, worked with him for for several years now, and and really trust and 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 like working with Jeremy. So so Jeremy, tell the the people in the audience today a little bit about your background and how you got into lending. Sure, sure. So I I got out of the military in 1998. And I kind of didn't know what I was going to do. Um, I like to problem solve. I And right before I got out, I went in to be a truck driver. So I was a motor transport operator. Mm-hmm. And somehow after I got back from uh, doing a tour in the Balkans, so we, we were down there in Serbia and Bosnia and, and, and all of that when that was a real hot area, um, I ended up in a, in a finance position. So we had a number of soldiers that were going TDY and we had to keep track of the orders that they filed and get reimbursed from finance, you know, the military's finance. And so I was in charge of a a lot of that. And so I kind of got, you know, my feet wet with dealing with finance and, and, uh, it just, it it was attractive to me. And somehow I ended up after I got out of the military, I went the IT route. So I was working for like Hewlett Packard and AT&T. I was running the call center. And a friend of mine, you know, that was doing mortgages was like, hey, you know, we need a guy to help us set up a network. My my boss needs help with all this. So I started doing some technical support for mortgage companies. And then before I, I knew it, my name got passed around and I saw what they were doing. I said, well, would you mind if I learned how to do this? Uh, and so I started moonlighting as a mortgage broker, um, as a loan officer underneath somebody else's license. And so I did that um, from the early 2000s, you know, all the way through 08, 09. That was a very painful experience, um, you know, at that time. <laughs> and, uh, it it was um, about uh, probably about eight, nine years ago, I decided that, you know, I still do mortgages um, in California, but I decided that I wanted to, you know, pivot. And so I got into business and commercial lending. And I noticed that all of my experience with the residential really helped me with the business side of things. And that's the reason why I'm able to get some deals pushed through because I understand uh, you know, personal credit a little bit more um, than somewhat than a typical business, uh, you know, broker or a typical business, you know, uh, lender and whatnot. And so a lot of times what will happen is these folks will walk into a bank and if it just doesn't fit inside of the box, then the bank has no, no solution for them, right? There's no alternative. A, we couldn't get you qualified for this, but we can get you this over here. And so being a broker, that gives me the availability to work with several different banks and and each bank has their own credit box. Most of them are very similar, but some understand certain asset classes better than others. And then the other thing is, is it's kind of like me prepping uh, my clients to get all the answers to the test, right? Before the test. So it's kind of like an exam cram. So I know what an underwriter is going to like, what they're not going to like. I know how to tweak your FICO score. Um, you know, cause sometimes that's the difference, you know, you could be, at, the requirement could be 700 FICO score, you got 698, you still don't get the wrong. It doesn't, doesn't make any sense. Um, so that's kind of, you, when that happens, they're like, sorry, right? <laughs> yeah. They, they don't really give a, a look at of action and say, Hey, if you do this, 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 and this, we can retry in a number of months. And, and the other thing that kind of hurts you too, is they'll have a, a hard rule that will say, 
they can't revisit it maybe for 120 days. So it's in your best interest to pull your credit before they pull your credit so that there's no surprises. You pay down some balances, boost your FICO score as high as you can, because it's not just about getting the loan, but it's also your loan interest rate is going to be determined on your FICO score. So there's like tiers, right? There's You know, they're going to give you a different rate and term on somebody that has a FICO score between 700 and 719, but somebody over 720 is going to get a better, better rate, better term. So my suggestion is, is before you go in there, before you apply, know what your FICO score is, know what that's going to look like. So then that way you can put your best foot forward. You can get the lowest rate and you can ensure that you're going to get approved. Oh, I love it. I love it. First of all, thank you for your service. Thank you. Appreciate that as a as a vet. Uh, we really appreciate that. So, this notion of pulling your credit before you do a loan, I love the idea. And uh, and my book talks about preparing for a sale. You know, designing your sale versus just uh, going out there. I call it mind your exit, don't blind your exit. And I love this. Uh, I love the way that you approach lending in the same manner which is let's prepare, let's get ahead of the issue. Let's, let's go on offense, not on defense. So right. yeah, I, I love it, Jeremy. So, so we appreciate that. The background and how you got started, very interesting from truck driver to lending expert. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So uh, tell us about, um, tell us about you're a broker and for the listeners, there's a huge difference between being a broker and being a banker or a bank. Uh-huh. And uh, I've worked with with many different sellers over the years, and it seems like they'll go to one large national bank, and then and uh, we wait and wait and back and forth for six months, and then they tell them no, right? And then you have to start over. So uh, maybe if you could elaborate a little more on the difference between a bank and a broker and how that works. Yeah, so a bank is going to only have products and services that are available to that bank. So they're, you know, you you can't necessarily walk into US Bank and then, you know, the US banker applies for the loan with you. You go down that process and then you find out days before you think you're going to get the money that it didn't meet their their criteria, right? So pretty much at that point if that's the end of your conversation, you know, the US Bank is not going to say, "Hey, we'll call my buddy over here at Key Bank and I'll send them all the information and whatnot." And so you're really limited with dealing with the bank. And and the other thing that I've seen as a person applying for a loan, because I've had small businesses myself, um, is, you know, bankers, you know, they get a nice, comfortable salary. You know, we all make the jokes about banker hours. Um, And, you know, they're really just kind of slow to respond and they don't necessarily have the same, you know, sense of urgency um, that I would. And so as a broker, I work with a lot of the big banks. Um, I also work with a lot of what we call non-bank banks. So they are banks that exist only to do loans, right? They don't take depository accounts. You can't set up a checking account. You can't set up a savings account. All they want to do is SBA loans, or they want to do a certain equipment class, or they want to do commercial real estate loans and package those up on a secondary market and sell those to investors. And so they exist just to make loans. And so they understand um, a lot more than a typical bank because a typical bank is trying to do everything for everybody, right? So there, gotcha. you have a community bank. Um, you know they want to be able to service the community. So you know maybe you know occasionally that loan officer does some SBA lending, but they're not really that's not really their bread and butter. It's not something they do every single day very well. And so me as a broker, that's where I shine, right? Because I can you know package those things up. I can send those to the banks that I know like that type of asset class. Um, and, you know, sometimes what happens is is banks just stop lending for a certain asset class because what happens is they have to keep diversity on their, on their balance sheets. And so if they have too many restaurants at one time, then that's, you know, making that risk higher for that industry. And so they need to, you know, they might just stop lending to restaurants, even though you have the next, you know, uh, Gordon Ramsay, you know, hit or whatever, they're just, they're not going to lend on it. And so as a broker, when you come to me, I'm going to do a better job of preparing you before I submit your loan. I'm going to try to catch things that an underwriter would ask about, or, you know, we call it, you know, having some hair on, on, on the deal. Right. Yeah. And so if I can get in front of that, um, what I've found is, is sometimes if you let an underwriter come to the conclusion by themselves, 
they're you know looking at something and then they make a conclusion about what this really is, then it's really hard to steer them away from that conclusion. Their their mindset is no, this is how it is. Whereas if beforehand you go in, you write up an executive summary, you say, hey, listen, you know, here we know that this is a weak area of this law, but here's what we're doing about it. And so it tends to help that go through um, easier. And so, you know, some people, when they think of a broker, they think of, oh, wow, this is going to cost me extra money. Um, you know, do I really need this guy? You know, I have a great relationship with my bank. Mm-hmm. And you know, my answer to that would be not necessarily a lot of times I get paid and I can get you a better deal than if you walked in on your own because, you know, I'm independent. So the bank's not paying for me to have, you know, class A real estate, for me to sit in a nice office. I pay my own expenses. They're not paying for a 401k. They don't have all that overhead. And so if they don't have all that overhead, then they can afford to give a loan at kind of wholesale. So it's like I'm like a wholesaler for loans, if you will. And so that's the advantage point for you is as well as you sit down and apply for one one time with me, I'm going to take that same application to different banks if we get a no over here. And in some situations, I'm going to run it concurrently. So we're not just waiting for a no and we've lost all this time. And then now we're starting the process over again. So those are those are the the, the advantages, I would say, of using a broker versus a banker. That makes that makes perfect sense. Um it's interesting. I've I've worked with um worked with with buyers in a sales transaction and and in working with the bank, they'll ask for a condition and you send it over. And then the next thing you know, you get a denial. And you're like, what? You know, you've been working with them for weeks and weeks and you're like, well, what? And they're like, yeah, you sent that over and that that killed your deal, right? And, and but I think a broker as a, as a person to kind of look at something before it goes to the underwriter and having another set of eyes look on it, look at it is extremely valuable. And And I'm going to put this up for our listeners. And that is even if a broker costs you more money, it's absolutely worth it. Um, and not that you do or don't, but but if it did, the the brain damage that you go through uh, and, and the way you can work for six months and then you send one piece of paper over on an email and the other underwriter denies your loan, you know, just if you had a broker, someone to look at that, it would just cause a lot of uh, less grief, <laughs> which yeah. is what we're all after. So you, yeah. you hit on a couple of things here that I, I, I'd i like to elaborate on, and that is that not all SBA lending is the same. Mm-hmm. You mentioned a bank will have a certain portfolio that they put together, and then they they uh, no longer have a liking for restaurants. But if you don't know that ahead of time, um, they accept your application. So they get paid based on the number of applications they get. So they love to accept the application and bring you in. They don't tell you ahead of time that they're not lending on restaurants. Why? Because they'll get sued for it, right? But anyway, where a guy like you knows the landscape of those lenders and knows what they're doing, and um, and that I think is the value also. Um, they'll just they'll they'll run you down the road for three months and then say, oh, we're not going to do it. And then you're like, wow, SBA won't do my deal, right? But that's not the case. It's the bank that won't do your deal. You need to go somewhere else. We've also run into what I call a two-tiered underwriting. And that is that um, people will say, okay, this is SBA qualified. And there's the SBA requirements up here. And then there's the bank requirements, which are often stricter than what the SBA is. And so, uh, and so picking not, and not all banks have those. Some of those banks are direct SBA direct where you only underwrite your file one time and that's it. But, um, not all banks are, are made alike. And I think sometimes we think that they are (laughs) and we can get discouraged through this process. You know, I've dealt with that where, where the bank's underwriting guidelines are more stringent than what SBA would, would be. And they're, they're denying our, our transactions. Right, but I go somewhere else. There's a there's a local bank. I'm not going to name names here, but there's one here. And boy, if it's not brick and mortar, they don't want to do it. You know, and yeah. it, one of my one of my buyers comes in and, and says, "I'm working with this bank." I'm like, "No, you're not. Not if you're buying this business, because I'm telling you right now, they're not going to do it." <laughs> but, the bank's only approving the unicorns, is what we we, we <laughs> the unicorns. I love it, <laughs> and it's just it's their bank's appetite for lending. They only like brick and mortar. They don't like, you know, on a lot of these, a lot of these business transactions, there's a good deal of goodwill or blue sky. And so you have the intangible assets and 
And some banks don't like the intangible assets. They're only going to lend on what they can go and see and feel and kick, you know. And and so having someone like yourself is extremely valuable through this transaction to uh, make sure it goes smoothly, make sure that there's less time spent and uh, and less, you know, less pulling the hair out on her head. I've lost nearly all the hair on my head. And, uh, you know, I feel like some of these one deal took it all out. <laughs> you're lucky, Jeremy. You've got you've got a pretty good head of hair there. So you're keeping it. <laughs> so I always I always like to ask these questions because I, I think that uh, learning a little bit more about about some of the mistakes you've made. But tell me, what, what are some of the biggest things that you learned as you got into lending or maybe some mistakes that you made early on that taught you lessons that you can share to help us? Absolutely. Um, you know, I think for me, I've, I've always been a champion for the underdog. So, you know, when I was very green in this industry, you know, I was trying to get everything pushed through. You know, there's just some loans that just they should never see the light of day. And there's just not enough there um, to really do it. And so sometimes when you do that, uh, you spin your wheels, um, you create fault hope for your clients, um, you create some bottlenecks for your lenders. You know, they're looking at your files as like, you know, oh man, I don't know if this one's really going to, you know, go through. Am I, should I take this guy's call? You know, yeah. those type of things are, 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 are crucial. And, you know, the other thing is, is it's just like, you know, if you have somebody or you go to a restaurant, you have a great experience, and then, you know, you recommend a friend or somebody else to go, and then they don't have a great experience, right? Somehow that all falls back on you, right? Yeah. So you have to be a little bit more selective as to, especially the relationships that I have with banks, who I introduce those relationships to, um, you know, and I've had deals where the client um, circumvented me and went directly to the bank. And some of those banks will push them back and say, hey, you know, you need to work through him. That's that's who we work through. And other banks are happy to just, you know, cut out the middleman and, and, and whatnot. So those are some tough lessons learned as to which banks, you know, value what I bring to the table and which customers I bring to the table. And, you know, not every customer is a customer that, you know, is a good customer for you. And, you know, having a hard conversation with somebody and saying, hey, listen, I don't think we're going to be a good fit. Um, you know, in some situations it'll get that customer back on the right track because now they feel like, okay, they don't take you for granted. And so, you know, when you're green, you're just eager to please everybody and, and you want everybody to be happy. And, and when you try to do that, you don't make no one happy. Right. Like when you mm -hmm. yeah. And so, yeah, I, I think those are some of the, the, the biggest mistakes, um, especially in this, in my industry, it's really kind of that age old, you know, saying it's not what you know, it's who you know, right? It's relationships. It's 100% relationships. And, you know, those are invaluable and you don't want to burn those bridges. And so, um, you know, you do that by making sure that the customers that you introduce to the banks are going to be a good fit for that bank. It's going to be, you know, a solid um, experience for everybody involved. And, uh, you know, also don't create false hope. Sometimes as a broker, the best thing that we can do is give a hard no, um, because I get people that ask me for stuff all the time. And then it's like, well, what about this? What about that? And I, sometimes I tell the bankers, you know, because they send me their turn downs, I say, look, I'm not going to get every deal pushed through, but there's a good chance I'll get, I'll get, I will get it pushed through. But if anything, I'll get that guy off your back, right? He's going to be calling you all the time. What about this, 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 and this? And it's like, I'll take that pressure off of you. And I'll put it back on me. So uh, I think those are right. the big things that I've, I've learned from, from being new and, and being experienced in season. Well, thank you. So, so let's talk about the landscape now. Let's talk about what's going on. Uh, SBA rates are up 5%, right? Uh, yes. the <laughs> residential refis are non-existent. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what are, are banks still lending? I mean, this environment, what's going on? Are, are you still doing deals? Are they, are they lending still? Are they holding back? Tell, tell us what you're seeing out there. Uh, the answer to that would be yes, yes and no. So um, they are lending, but what they're doing is they're tightening up that credit box. Um, earlier, you mentioned that SBA has their own set of rules and then banks have their own set of rules, right? We call those overlays, right? So SBA is pretty wide. They're out here mm -hmm. and then banks are right here. And so we're seeing a lot of that. We're seeing banks pull back from certain asset classes that they're thinking are going to be more risky. Um, the other day, I, um, I've been doing a lot of refinances for 7A loans that have commercial real estate, and we're either trying to put those into 504 
or we're, we're getting a better rates that are fixed on an index that is not Wall Street Journal Prime. So I was getting some hotel deals and I had some letters of interest from the bank um, securing them, you know, great interest rate. And uh, then it, no so, no sooner after I did that and I was putting together a package, the bank came back and said, look, we're, we're putting a moratorium on hospitality. So uh-huh. we're stepping away from hospitality. And so that leaves you, you know, there's not a lot of options. Um, but what they're doing is they're, they're tightening up their credit guidelines, right? So, you know, before maybe they were approving something that's 640, now it's, you know, 680 or 700. Um, maybe they want more, they're going to do less blue sky deals. Um, but what I can say, the good news is, is that SBA has made some recent changes. Um, for 40 years, SBA does loans through banks, and then they also do loans through non-banks, right? So a non-bank would be there were 14 companies that kind of had the market share that were non-depository banks that could participate with SBA loans. Things like Blue Vine, On Debt, Cabbage, um, you know, those those companies had the lion's share of being able to do an SBA loan um, if you didn't go through a regular traditional depository bank or credit union, that type of stuff. Well, as of April 12th this year, they lift, they've lifted a 40-year moratorium on that. And so what that means is, is other non-bank lenders, people that want to participate in this non-profits will be able to get licensing from SBA and be able to participate with SBA loans. And so that's going to create much more competition for those 14 big guys. And it's also going to open up more gateways for underserved communities, um, smaller loan amounts, that type of stuff. And so, you know, from that standpoint, we're going to see more competition and so that's going to benefit um, the individual borrower overall, for sure, because when there's more competition in the market, that's going to lower rates, that's going to create uh, more opportunities that were not available beforehand. So I, I see some good things coming down the pipe for that. Love it. Absolutely love it. I love to see competition with the lenders. You know, they they think they're the only game in town. So love that. So there were a couple other things you were telling me about that are coming down the pike in regard to the sellers being able to work in the business and the standby provisions. So talk about those two. You were the first to tell me about these, by the way. So these are all of these things that are coming out right now with SBA. Um, Some of them are going to be rolled out as of August. But going back to, you know, the banks are going to put their own restrictions on top of that. But, you know, some banks are going to open up, you know, uh, a lot wider. But typically in the past, what would happen and we have a deal right now that you and I are working on with the cabinet uh, company. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, we have three owners that are part of the cabinet, you know, company's uh, ownership. And one of the requirements is and for the new buyer to come in is that the there's two owners that want to hang on, hang on, you know, even after they sell their shares in the company, they still want to be a part of the organization. Well, the old way of doing things with SBA said that those owners needed to exit the company within 12 months. That they can't. So absolutely ridiculous, by the way. Yeah, you take the people who are most qualified to help with the most experience and you limit the amount that they can contribute to the business that they've been contributing to for 40 years. It's like, ah, I don't know the guy that, that came up with that rule, but I would love to have a debate with him. I'd love to go bonk him on the head, actually, because it was such a ridiculous rule. And I'm so excited they're changing that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, definitely. I, I think SBA has gotten a lot more light shined on that that uh, organization within the government uh, as a result of what happened with PPP and all of the stuff during the pandemic, right? You know, a lot of people didn't get money that needed to get money and money ran out. And, you know, there were a lot of communities that were underserved because they didn't have access. You know, they didn't have JP Morgan Chase Banker on speed dial. Um, so, yeah. That's definitely going to even the playing field, but uh, I think they've heard, you know, the 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 complaints, and so they're opening things up and they're putting more control back to the banks or the uh, you know whoever's going to fund the loan, and they're putting more of that responsibility on them. But yeah, I think that's a great thing to be able to continue to have somebody in business, and so that also allows for a buy-in, buy-out type of situation. So yeah, now if somebody wants to continue to maintain ownership in the, in the company, the existing company or a new one that's created, if they're under 20%, then they don't have to be a part of the new SDA loan for, for the acquisition. Now, if they're older, then they're going to have to be a personal guarantor on it. So if they just keep their percentage under the 20%, they can still be a part of that company. 
under the new ownership and not have all the liabilities to be able to add all of the, you know, uh, seasonality and, and experience that, that, that comes with, you know, they've been working in the company, they own it and they run it. And I think that's going to help you as well, because I think, you know, uh, sometimes the thought of, of selling a business is kind of like letting go of something that's been a legacy for them and something that's like their baby. And so now they don't have to fully let go uh, as a result. Exactly. And what we were having, and my sellers hated it. So what was happening was the sellers would say, okay, so you want me to carry a seller note for five years, but I can only contribute to the business for one. So for four years, I got to hope that this new buyer who I know, and I've only known for a few weeks or a couple months here, I'm turning everything over to him and hoping he's going to pay me and I can't contribute to the business. The bank will not let me contribute to the business. And so anyway, you I, I'm not going to share all the expletives that were that have been shared with me about how stupid that was, but I, I'm glad that common sense is ruling is prevailing yeah. a little bit. And that, and as we're talking about notes, the other thing that the big complaint I was getting was the standby provisions, and this just came out the last couple of years, where SBA required that the sellers be on standby with the seller note for anywhere from 12 months to 10 years, mm-hmm. and the sellers hated that. Right. They're like, wait a minute, I'm going to carry this paper. And again, I'm not going to have control. I can't be in there. I can't influence them. I just got to hope that I get paid. So tell us about the standby provisions and the changes coming around. So in order to do an SBA loan, right, uh, SBA is going to lend 90% of, 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 of the cost. Right. Um, and so, our, you know, the banks, the SBA says that you can do up to 90%. So there has to be an injection of 10%. So where does the 10% come from? 10% can come, 5% can come from the buyer. Another 5% can come from, you know, the seller taking a note. And that note would typically have to be put on standby in order for it to be considered equity. Now, you can design a note where, you know, the seller's carrying, you know, doing a 10% note, but only 5% of that is on standby because you have the other 5% from the buyer. So together, that's the 10% equity injection that's needed. Um, but what this is doing now is is it, that same with seller no will now also be considered equity injection provided that there's no payments on it for uh, 24 months. So after month 24 on month 25, they can start taking payments and that's still considered equity injection to the deal. So that's going to allow the seller to get paid a lot sooner uh, rather than to put that on standby. So that that's, that's a new provision. Um, but there's also talk that if the, um, it can debt service between the SBA loan and a seller note that the seller note could potentially even be interest only and still be considered equity injection into the deal. So those are the changes that are coming out. Yep. Love it. I wish it were zero months. We'll take 24, but 24 is a lot better than 10 years. Yes. That- <laughs> That's what we've been dealing with is 10 years. <laughs> All right. Any, any other nuances you'd like to share anything else that you're seeing that's exciting yeah so an, another thing that they're changing is is the the affiliate status and i run into this you know sometimes some of my hotel owners um will have ownership across multiple hotels right so i'm trying to do this transaction with this person over here at you know days in but he owns a la quinta best western and all the other stuff well, in the past, if he owned more than 20% of each one of those businesses, I had to get tax returns for all those businesses that he, he owned more than 20% of. And so that's now, that affiliate status has now changed to 50%. So that's going to make you know things a lot easier because before what they would do is they would look at, okay, I'm looking at this business to finance it, but I got to see what's going on with all your other businesses. Even though it doesn't really you know relate to this business, it still has somewhat of a, a global burden on a borrower. So now we're digging into all of those things. So now, unless they're 50% or more, we don't need to see the tax returns on that business. That's not going to come into play with with uh, the underwriting of another business. So right. see, that is, is a huge advantage. Um, I think it will allow um, more deals to happen because then you'll be able to pull a lot more um, equity you know, investors and people that want to be a part of a business so you can pull capital together and take down on businesses. So that's terrific. Thank you. So our, our guest today has been Jeremy Willis and uh, the big takeaways are make sense lending coming down the pike <laughs> from the SBA. Pull your credit before 
you send it to the lender and take a look at it. If you're a 698 credit score, do what you need to do to get a 700 or <laughs> whatever that is. Brokers are good, not bad, <laughs> and identify your weaknesses early on. I, I really appreciate those takeaways and appreciate your time today, Jeremy. So share your contact information with our listeners today, please. So our website is uh, Outside the Box Funding. So you can find that at otbfunding, F-U-N-D-I-N-G dot net. Um, and then if you wanted to send me an email, my email is jeremy at otbfunding.net. Um, I guess I could give you my cell phone number as well. Area code 510-342-2880. Terrific. Thank you, Jeremy. You have a great uh, great day and appreciate you, you being on our show today. Thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it. Thank you, Rick. You're welcome. Have a great day. Thank you, listeners. And till next time, it's Rick, your M&A cowboy from Heber City, Utah. Thank you for attending our podcast. We invite you to join us for future episodes of M&A, Murders and Accusations, the good, the bad, and the ugly of selling your business. You can also visit us at www.bsalesgroup.com or email Rick directly at rick at bsalesgroup.com.